issues that we might encounter living in today. But the thing about positive psychology is to say, general, traditional psychology is focused on the red king, things that we need to fight, things that we need to actually really put some energy and effort towards mitigating. But what about the things that we wanna grow? And can't there be some science behind it? And about 10 years ago, for every single study that was done on the red cape side, there was only like a 0.01 study done on the how to grow good stuff. Over time, it's increased significantly, but we're still nowhere near where it could be about really understanding well-being and its factors. So positive psychology is all about the green cape, but it's recognizing that the foundation is the mix of the two. And this word right here, PERMA, it's the acronym for how to increase well-being in your life, how to increase well-being in your children's lives. P is positive emotion. So there's 10 top positive emotions that we experience on the daily or the monthly, and it's joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and love. Those 10 positive emotions help us become more resilient. They help us become, but they buffer the times that we have to think about how we can move towards thriving. And the reason why this is an important part of this equation is because it's really thought of as the, the pleasant life. If we can learn how to bring more positive emotions into our lives, we, we learn we live more pleasant lives. But we're not just seeking pleasure. We're also seeking engagement, which is what the E stands for. And the notion of engagement is fascinating to me because it's not necessarily pleasant in the moment because engagement and all the research shows that you have to be pushed a little bit and sometimes it's a little painful, but it's like you've gotten to that point. It's almost thought of as like being in the zone as an athlete. When you hit that sense of engagement, you're so consumed with it that you lose a sense of time. And it's honestly studied that that is the highest form of well-being because you kind of lose that constriction with the mind and you start to be so engaged that you create this, this full body, mind, spiritual effect. And what I love about the E is that it's considered the engaged life. But the engaged life has its own limitations as well because it's very self-focused. So we start bringing into the next layers, the relationships and our sense of meaning and our sense of accomplishments, we can start to say, how can we go from pleasant life and engaged life to more of a meaningful life? How can we bring more meaning? And it's not just for ourselves, but it might be for our family. It might be for the groups that we influence. And so with meaning, it's about how can we serve others? And I, this is a, y'all were talking about humor and comedy. And so there's not always a ton of humor and comedy in positive psychology, but this A piece of it is kind of interesting because I spent a lot of my early life really focused on the A, like I think a lot of us do, you know, like accomplishment, accomplishment, but it doesn't lead towards well-being. In fact, my friend said, you sounded like kind of an A-hole, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so real quickly, just a few other concepts of positive psychology is that when we broaden positive emotions, we broaden our experience, which broadens our mindset. And by doing that, we build the resources to becoming more resilient. And it helps us in the future to say, oh yeah, I've experienced this before. I can get back to more of that positive state. Dipping down because of the negativity bias is normal. And that's exactly what happened to us. I think it was really fascinating. When we were sitting here, all of us kind of like, were like, what's going on? And for, for very important reasons. Now that we're kind of like under the assumption that everything is fine, right? We can start to kind of move slightly in one way. This negativity bias is really very, uh, it, it's to a point of making sure that we've crossed the road, we check and see both sides, right? And, and, and these are foundational things of us staying alive. But if all we do is think about that, well, then we lose what's called this three to one ratio. This is the recipe for thriving versus languishing. This is positive to negative. That doesn't mean you need to like sit there and start analyzing because that's generally not a positive uh, thing to do. <laughs> but having a moment where you can even say at the end of the day, or like, okay, what are three good things that happened to me, to me today? because our body's holding on to all the stress and the tension from the day. And if we take just a split moment to navigate towards the good, then it starts to start to balance the equation out so that the positive starts to unfold. I have a nine-year-old son, and this is something that we're working with him every single day because he comes home, how was school? Uh, boring, you know, it's, 
Um, what, what was your favorite part of your day? I'm like trying to like, coax him into this positive. Lunch, you know, <laughs> and recess, and it's uh, we all can relate to this. I mean, some of the lucky few out of there, I don't know, exist. Um, but the, the thing is, is that we make this a part of our dinner conversation. I start to say, okay, here are three good things that happened to me. And guess what typically nine times out of 10 happens? As soon as I say my first one, he remembers something from his day that then it's like, oh yeah. And so this is an element, an example of that negativity bias that we all hold. It's really consuming. So how can we take a moment as, um, you know, leaders within our community, leaders within our families and create this? It might be even something fun we do at the PTA, right? Is to say three good things that happened last month before we get started. Not trying to push my agenda on you guys, but it's just, <laughs> like it's, a, yeah, it's a fun way to think about it. And, it, and, and the notion, I'm gonna go back to that slide, it broadens positive emotion broadens. It's not just light, fluffy stuff. It sets a foundation and it sets kind of forward movement for us to build deeper, richer conversations. Okay, and this is also shown in nature called the heliotropic effect. Um, this heliotropic effect is essentially saying that we are living systems, we are drawn towards things that give us life. And the heliotropic, if you watch like a sun, as the sun goes up, it goes down, and if you watch nature, flowers follow it. So that's where it comes from, is this notion of the heliotropic effect. And very much true, just like we have a negativity bias, we're also, we're also very drawn towards things that make us feel alive and awake and energized. And so how can we bring more of that? So I'm gonna kind of transition this over into like actually the adolescent piece of, of the puzzle. Because our goal is that all of us in our daily lives create positive interventions for ourselves as well as for perhaps our children. Because that downward spiral, I know I'm going through these slides because I, I want to I be respectful of your time, but the upward spiral would be the broadening. This upward spiral with positive emotions help broaden. Negative emotions, what do they do? They constrict and they make us go down. And sometimes it makes us see things this way. Uh, yeah, that's right, that, that. So we keep going down and down and down until we put in that positive intervention. It's like a little stopping point. Just to simply say, okay, what are the tools I can bring out right now? What are the tools in my toolkit that I feel really good about? Sometimes it's taking a deep breath in. Sometimes it's going and taking an exercise class. Sometimes it's putting on your favorite playlist. Sometimes it's about taking a bubble bath. Sometimes it's about, you know, just spending time in nature. Sometimes it's about going into uh, spin social connections, calling a friend. So all of us have our own unique ways of what works for us. And so, as individuals we do this, as families we do this, but as an institution, and an institution of people that are in this group that have a common, common goal of how can we help to bring a mindset, perhaps a cultural component of our institutions that we're a part of. So think of it, the schools we're a part of, um, the businesses that we attend, you know, the churches, the um, companies that we work for, all those are different examples of institutions. So that learning to thrive model of languishing, using resilience to help us to move towards thriving. This is the connector. All right, have you ever read the book Grit or seen the book Grit? Mm -hmm. So there's, it's a great book and it's very easy. Um, Angela Duckworth, she was actually one of our professors at Penn, and she's literally just showing that the number one factor to success on all fronts stems from grit and resilience. So how do we learn grit and resilience? Well, let's talk about that for just a few moments. Because we are more than just this room right here. We have our own biology that we have to think about, right? So how do we build resiliency in our biology? Well, we make sure we don't get too hungry. We make sure we get plenty of sleep because um, we know that when we don't get those things that we're less resilient. We build practices of self-awareness. You know what the number one way to build self-awareness is that's technically been studied? Mindfulness, meditation. Mm -hmm. The research behind this is powerful. We develop skills of self-regulation. Things like even playing the game of Jenga take some self-regulation, you know, of, of very slowly adapting to this. And I, and I want you to think about this from both your lens as well as your children's <clears throat> lens. What are the things that we can help to help their biology? What are the things that we can help them to build their self-awareness? What are some skills that we develop to build self-regulation? 
And I know a lot of us uh, enter into the adolescence zone thinking that kind of time has already passed, they either get it or they don't, but that's not technically true. Because mental agility is constantly being developed. In just a second, we'll talk about the time frames in our life when they're the most developed. Optimism, this is called your explanatory style. It's not about just like seeing everything as rosy. It's about, again, developing a tool that when can I use optimism and when can I use pessimism? Because honestly, the, the, the fascinating thing about pessimism is that there are certain times when pessimism is very, very needed. It's appreciated. It creates a whole new lens of things and it's very important. But again, if you're not getting the full picture and the full spectrum, then you're missing part of it. So optimism, the explanatory style, is there's a lot of research about how it can actually prevent depression and anxiety. So from a self-efficacy perspective, how does this help with our, our resiliency? It kind of goes back to the notion of where do we feel most competent and confident and where can we utilize our strengths? Connection, have a group of people. You probably have heard the like sitting is the new smoking. Well, being socially isolated is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's this is like what researchers are comparing it to. And if you think about it, like in the prison system, like what's the worst punishment that they have, well, it's isolation. And it's because it's that important for our ability to, to truly live. It's the number one factor to longevity above smoking, above diet, above exercise, it's social interaction. And then the final piece is the institutions, our positive institutions. Now we know that not all the institutions that we're a part of are positive. So that's my call to you today is to say like this is the new year, right? It's we're all about well-being. How can we start to create this new decade and put some energy towards this? And so the adolescent time frame in our lives is considered another zero to three time frame in life. Literally from 13 all the way to 18, the brain changes just as much as it did from when kids were zero to three. So we're all out of luck. <laughs> just kidding. It always is developing and mindfulness is another tool that has shown to produce what's called neuroplasticity. But this is a big, big, huge, very significant for all of us that are in this room. Because in the United States, we think of just like holding on tight through adolescence and just quote unquote like surviving it. But what if we brought a different angle to it and said, okay, well, we know that there's a lot of brain development that happens at this time of life. What are some things that we can do to help cognitive and behavioral changes for a positive? There's a, you could, I could spend a whole another two hours, hour on this slide alone because there's this concept of positive risk taking, right? We know that adolescent time frame, there's a lot of risk taking. So how do we make sure that there's a notion of, uh, of really looking at all the red cape and the green cape side of things? Promising interventions, some of them I've already talked about, are meditation, aerobic activity. Do you know that cardiovascular, when you get your heart rate above 65% towards its, towards its max, that's another time where your brain becomes more plastic, it becomes more malleable, and so you're developing new pathways. So cardiovascular exercise is really, really incredible. Teaching specific regulation strategies. Um, you know, I have a nine-year-old, so I'm less familiar with strategies uh, for adolescents, but there are games. I mean, it's something as simple as Simon says is a self-regulation game that you can play. Like I said earlier, Jenga. And then disciplined physical activity. Um, I'm not trying to promote define when I say this, but when you're doing physical activity that you are having to listen to an instructor and they're, t and they're telling you what to do and you're following it, these are all skills for building neuro new neural pathways for the brain. It's really interesting that, that Science is finally saying yay to exercise when for so long it, it really, it didn't talk so much about the variety, the, the uh, expandedness of exercise. So I'll wrap this up in just a few minutes, um, but the key questions that we're asking are like, should we teach skills for well-being? I mean, and I think most of us in this room are like, of course, yeah, we should definitely do that. So why aren't we doing it in schools? You know, why are we focusing so much on the skills and the knowledge, but yet not putting as much energy on the well-being? And do well-being skills really have instrumental and intrinsic value? And I think the other big question that we have to ask ourselves is like, well, okay, what are the reasons why we're not teaching well-being? And a lot of the times it's because well, we're limited on time and we think that maybe teaching well-being will take away from some of the other courses. So does teaching well-being contribute to better academic performance and other life outcomes? And guess what? 
it does. There are these key measures. So the EPIC uh, measure of adolescent well-being, it's engagement, it is perseverance, it's optimism, it's connectedness, and it's happiness. And it's this measurement. And there's a couple of uh, classmates that I actually have who were earning their PhD while I was in school. And this guy named um, uh, uh, Johann Adler, he's created this theory of change. It's all centered around when we bring well-being into groups, when we bring well-being as a cultural norm, we start to see academic improvements. And so what starts is with educator well-being. The educator, which we're gonna consider ourselves educators for our family right now, okay? Not thinking just of the teachers, but that's another part of the puzzle. But educator well-being, how can we start to incorporate the skills, the knowledge, and the resources to promote well-being? And it kind of goes back to all the other pieces that I was saying. I work with this every single day of my life, and there are many days when I still struggle with my well-being, just like all of us. And I feel like I have skills. So thinking about people that haven't spent as much of their time learning about it, well, yeah, of course, we're all struggling with well-being. There's so many moving pieces. But by creating a process of focusing on educator well-being, there is systemic changes in whole school, psychosocial, culture, and environment. And the way that we do that is by what's called helping develop strengths, helping people develop their character strengths. And I, my presentation finishes with that. By focusing on the whole institution and coming up with program well-being, we start to see improvements in student well-being, which then has been shown to lead towards better academic performance, as well as other life outcomes. It's much deeper and much more complex than just this simple slide, right? There's a lot of those layers. Remember the biology, remember the self-regulation and the self-awareness. These all correspond to how we start to be positive influences and create positive interventions. So these last couple of slides are about one of the most effective ways, aside from the three to one, uh, that three to one ratio, which I really hope that you play with and see how you can make it your own so it works for your situation and your context. Another really powerful thing, and if you want to write this down, I would encourage you for your own sake, or maybe even have your child do this, but go to viacharacter.org, V-I-A character.org. You can take a free assessment here. It's developed by University of Pennsylvania, and I'm sure some of you have heard of um, like your, uh, your strengths, strengths finders. It, that's the same science that they just happened to create and made a business out of it. This is for free. This is the, this is the original science that started strengths finders. They've adapted it and kind of shifted it slightly. But the concept is that we all are a combination of a variety of different strengths, and we have our own top five. Our top five are considered to be our dominant strengths. And throughout a lot of life, we focus on how to improve our weaknesses, but how can we instead improve our strengths? And by doing that, we begin to increase our P, positive emotion, E, our sense of engagement, R, our relationships, M, our sense of meaning, and A, our sense of accomplishment. And so therefore, we increase our well-being. So one of my big strengths is creativity as well as love of learning. And so I think this is interesting to think of my side because of in my family and my relationships. If I were to take you to creativity, you know, if it's used in excess, it can be seen as eccentricity, right? Or even my sense of love of learning can be seen as a know-it-all-ism. And so where this applies into my life is that we are all unique and very different. And I might have, in my relationships, uh, people think of me as a know-it-all sometimes, right? And so I have to monitor myself at times, but I also know that I try to express that it's really just coming from a love of learning, and if I can see my strength as a strength, other people will start to see it as a strength as well, and think about how that shifted your whole like attitude towards like a know-it-all, uh, we all hate know-it-alls, right? But if we can shift our mindset to see it as a love of learning, we're like, oh, ah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and how can we see our children in that same light, in that same lens? Well, let's think about uh, vitality we might actually not recognize it as vitality. Instead, we see it as hyperactivity, right? And so if we, I have a nine-year-old son who definitely falls into this category. And thinking instead of like that constant reminder, how can I see it as vitality? And how can I help him like hone in on that strength to be utilized in all of his activities that he's doing? 
So going back to the very, very first question that I asked <laughs> is, where are we wearing the red cape in our lives? Where are we wearing the green cape in our lives? And how can we start to learn how to make it more reversible so that it's really, really a powerful influence on all of those elements of our biology, of awareness, of, of our positive institutions? And how can we help benefit ourselves, our families, as well as all the different institutions that we're involved in? So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, I know I went maybe a little long. I don't even know what time I fully started. But um, I'm more than happy to stick around.